Hello, and welcome to another episode of If Guitars Could Speak, where we examine interesting pieces of gear, musicians, or moments from rock history. Today we will be looking at not one, but two matching Gibson J160E acoustic electric guitars that were bought for John Lennon and George Harrison of the Beatles by their manager, Brian Epstein. The story of these guitars would start uneventfully, but these twins would undergo very different stories over the past 50 years. But before we get into it, as always, please subscribe to this channel to see more guitar story and content like this, and to be sure to like the video if you think other people would like to see videos like this too. Now with that, let's look at the twin Beatle Gibsons separated at birth. As the Beatles' popularity in the early 1960s grew, so did their salary, and with it, their ability to purchase real gear. Much of that early gear would go on to become staples of the Beatles' live shows. Paul's 1961 Hofner violin bass, John's 1958 Rickenbacker 325 Capri, George's Gretsch Duo Jet. But a pair of guitars would actually make much more of an impact on the early Beatle records than some of those electric instruments. The Beatles were primarily a live band early in their career, and employed an electric guitar and bass lineup with amplifiers, leaving the acoustic guitars of their youth behind at home. But as the Beatles entered the studio for their formative years in 1962 and 63, they realized that they needed another layer to their songs that they seemed to be missing. They realized that they needed a good old acoustic backing track, and the old beat-up toy guitars that they'd had in their youths weren't going to get the job done. The Beatles manager would do anything to ensure the band's success. So in September of 1962, Brian Epstein would visit Rushworth's Music House in Liverpool, where he would procure two identical Gibson J160E acoustic electric guitars for John and George. These two guitars would cost 161 pounds each at the time, or over $4,000 of today's money each. They were the top of the line in American-made acoustic electric guitars at the time. Each guitar was a round shoulder style with a vintage sunburst finish and a solid Sitka spruce top. They were fitted with an open coil P90 pickup, tightly placed under the fretboard and over the sound hole. The guitar was known to produce a surprisingly balanced and woody tone through an amp despite the simplistic electronics. The Beatles referred to their Gibsons as their Jumbos. The guitar registered to George was serial number 73157, and the one given to John was 73161. A few recordings and pictures exist of John and George brandishing their new weapons together in 1963, but after a time, it seemed that only John was pictured with his. Most fans chalk this up to the fact that George was the lead guitarist and so played the electric guitar most of the time, but Sadly, this wasn't the only reason for its disappearance. The early days of Beatlemania saw a lot of shows, recordings, and BBC appearances as the band's popularity grew by leaps and bounds in their home country of the UK. Most times, John and George would use their jumbos as backstage warm-up guitars and as the last straw backups in case their other guitars had problems. Either one or the other would often go home with the guitar and leave the other with the rest of their equipment. This was most likely how the two guitars got swapped. At one point, the guitar that had originally been John's was used by George and vice versa. But it was at the end of the show season right before the New Year's of 1964 when John noticed his jumbo had inexplicably disappeared. John recalled, George and I often took a jumbo home with us, so nobody noticed at the end of the season that one was missing. A week or two afterwards, I asked Mal where he'd put my jumbo. It was only then that we realized the guitar had been pinched at Finsbury Park, and no, I never got it back. Mal Evans, the Beatles' road manager, was stricken. He recalled the loss of the guitar as one of the worst mistakes of his career. John was known to be a teaser and would never let him live the moment down, often joking with Mal that he would get a raise when you find my jumbo. But because George was the lead guitarist, John ended up playing and keeping the other J160E as his own as the Beatles' career progressed. This would be the guitar that John would be pictured playing in A Hard Day's Night 
It was the guitar that, while leaning up against an amp during I Feel Fine sessions, caused the infamous feedback that caused the band to leap up and ask George Martin to add it to the intro of the song. And later in 1967, John would add a psychedelic paint job by The Fool, as Eric Clapton had done with his Gibson SG, with waves of purple and light blue. Then, less than a year later, he would strip it down to the natural wood in 1968, which is the way it would stay for the rest of its life, save for some hand-drawn caricatures of John and Yoko done by Lennon himself. And all this time, John was actually making a guitar that was originally purchased for George Harrison Famous. But what of the guitar that was lost way back in the Christmas tour of 1963? Well, to say that the guitar would go on to an ordinary life is an understatement. The next time that the guitar was known to have surfaced, it was in San Diego, California in 1969, when it was purchased by a man named Tommy Presley at a local music store known as the Blue Guitar. He hung on to the Gibson only for a couple of years, before selling it to a friend named John McCall to help pay for a move to Northern California. McCall had always been enamored by the guitar and enjoyed playing country and bluegrass tunes on it. He hung it on his wall and often played the guitar through the years, enjoying the rich tones that only a Gibson acoustic can provide. The years became decades and McCall and the Gibson grew older together. It was in 2014 when he noticed a magazine at his guitar group featuring George's son Danny, who had done a spread on George's guitars. It talked about the Gibson J160Es and listed the serial number, which was only a few away from a cause. At first, he was just happy to know what year his guitar had been made in. But as time went on, and he learned more about the twin guitars purchased back in 1963, he became even more curious. He noticed that the wood grain of the guitars were strikingly similar. Eventually, unable to ignore the history, McCall called a guitar teacher friend of his named Mark Intravaya, and he pulled up some videos on YouTube and was able to match up a fishhook-shaped scratch that appeared to still be on the guitar. Next, McCall would contact the Beatles gear aficionado, Andy Babiuk, who literally wrote the book on the Beatles gear to try to verify the axe. Babiuk didn't even need a week to match up the wood grain scratches, and serial number, he verified that it was indeed the same guitar purchased by Brian Epstein in 1963 from Rushworth's music store in Liverpool. McCall knew that the guitar was now bigger than him and had to be given back to rock and roll history. As he prepared to auction the guitar, he called Yoko Ono to let her know about the guitar and give her a heads up that it would be going on the auction block. They agreed to amicably split the profits from the auction sale because, God knows, Yoko needed more money. But enough about that. McCall would place the guitar in a safe deposit vault to await the auction, going to visit the guitar from time to time so he could play it, change the strings, and keep it fresh. Strangely though, McCall would say that the guitar didn't feel the same after he found out its famous pedigree. He would say it played different. It just had John Lennon's aura his soul wrapped around it in many different ways. And everybody who had played it prior to our discovery and who I let play it after our discovery would tell you the same thing. It just was a different feel. There was a reverence to it that was inexplicable. The guitar would sell at a Julian auction in November of 2015 for $2.41 million to an anonymous buyer. Could have been Yoko for all we know. At the time, this was the most expensive guitar ever sold. Unfortunately, neither the seller or the guitar have come forward since the sale, and so we may have seen the last of the 1962 Gibson J160E with the serial number 73161. Although these two Gibson guitars would be separated for decades, their histories will remain forever intertwined, even though one had a painfully short Beatle career. John McCall was certainly the best caretaker of the guitar that one could hope for, having loved and played the guitar as his own for years. As a result, the guitar survived through the decades, and the fact that it still exists is the most important thing. That's another episode of If Guitars Could Speak. Remember, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Guitar Historian channel, and also be sure to hit the like button to let YouTube know that other guitar fans would like to see this video. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. <laughs>